No, your eyes do not deceive you. This is a developer spotlight video. Yes, it's been over three years since I did an episode in this series. I love doing these, but they take up so much time, it's unfeasible for me to do them regularly. This time we're looking at a developer that was influential straight out of the gate, Treasure. Treasure was founded in Tokyo in mid-1992 by Masato Mayagawa. He'd previously worked for Konami on games like The Simpsons and Bucky O'Hare arcade games and Castlevania 4 on the Super Nintendo, but decided to open his own studio, taking several other former Konami employees with him. Treasure's leadership structure was more flexible than most, so each team member would take on a more senior role depending on the project and their availability at the time. Mayagawa founded the company due to Konami's tendency to prioritise sequels to established franchises like Castlevania, which was the opposite of what he wanted to be doing, creating original ideas. The company's name came from his desire to create a studio that would be a treasure to the games industry. This is evident from their formative years, during which Treasure didn't release a single sequel, right up until 2000. They initially developed for Sega consoles exclusively until 1997. The first of Treasure's games was Gunstar Heroes. Few companies have had as strong an opening as Treasure had with Gunstar Heroes. It's mad to think that this was their first game, as it's become so well regarded when it comes to the Mega Drive's library, and it's just so well designed and executed that you could be forgiven for thinking that a seasoned development team was behind it. Released in September 1993 and published by Sega exclusively for the Mega Drive, or Genesis if you're in North America, Gunstar Heroes was a run and gun action game. The idea was actually conceived in 91 while the team was still at Konami, originally titled Lunatic Gunstar. They pitched the idea, but Konami weren't interested, claiming that the game wouldn't sell. Mayagawa and the team had had enough of Konami resting on their laurels, and formed their own development studio, giving them the freedom to experiment. They picked Sega's Mega Drive to develop the game for, as they felt it had the more capable processor, and was more suited to the experimental manner in which they planned to develop the game. Sega weren't willing to publish the game at first, which was fair enough seeing as Treasure hadn't developed a single game. Instead, they gave them McDonald's Treasureland Adventure to develop for the Mega Drive, which would act as a test of sorts. Also, Sega of America weren't too keen on the word lunatic being in the title, so rejected it, along with another possible title, Blade Gunner, which was vetoed for copyright reasons. Sega suggested the word heroes, and the game became Gunstar Heroes. They obviously proved themselves in Sega's eyes, and after a few months of working on McDonald's Treasureland Adventure, they were cleared to start work on Gunstar Heroes. They developed the two in tandem, and although the former was completed first, Treasure decided to release Gunstar Heroes first as they wanted their debut to be an original game. The game's popularity took most people by surprise, including Sega, who failed to meet the initial demand as they'd produced a pessimistic number of units. So, onto the game. As I said, Gunstar Heroes is a run and gun game. It's really hectic with enemies flying around the screen at all times, and you'll be hard pressed to find a faster paced action game on the Mega Drive. It's also very accomplished graphically, which is even more impressive at this speed. You play as one of the two Gunstars, or both in co-op, who are pretty nimble. Most of the levels are played in typical Contra style run and gun fashion, but there are also levels where the Gunstars ride in wall crawling minecarts or pilot a ship. There's even a section laid out like a board game, with each square on the board presenting a challenge, be it fight a mini boss or complete a task. There are seven levels in all, with the first four being playable in any order. Completing a level would increase your character's health. The bosses are unique, varied and elaborate. This was another reason for Treasure picking Sega's 16-bit console, as they stated that some of these bosses simply wouldn't have been possible on the Super Nintendo. At the game's start, you can select whether to play in free or fixed firing mode. In the free mode, your character travels in the direction in which you're firing, and in fixed mode, your character remains static. This considerably changes how the game feels and plays, so it's best to experiment and see what feels right for you. There are four shot types from which to choose too, and this is where we find one of the game's most interesting ideas come into play. The four shot types as described in the manual are Force, a blast of plasma energy Lightning, a stream of electricity 
Chaser, laser darts that seek out and destroy multiple targets, and Fire, a flamethrower most effective at close range. You can carry two weapons at a time and choose which one you want to use. Sure, that was nothing new, but here's where Gunstar Heroes stood out. You can combine any two weapons to make a single, more powerful shot. For example, combining the force and fire shots will create an exploding fireball. Chaser and lightning combine to form homing electricity, and you can even combine two of the same shot type to create an ultimate version of that shot. In addition to their weaponry, the Gunstars can also kick or throw enemies. A well-timed throw can launch a foe into a group of other enemies, taking them out. The two characters have slightly different attacks too. Red Gunstar can perform a body slam, while Blue can do a flying kick or drop kick. Interestingly, despite being a console exclusive, Gunstar Heroes plays just like an arcade run and gun, from the structure of the levels to the rapid onslaught of enemies and frequent mini-bosses. The soundtrack is mostly very good, if you can hear it over all the chaos. This game is a blast, especially in co-op, and it seems to have flown under the radar for many Mega Drive owners back in the day, myself included. Gunstar Heroes received critical acclaim and became a fan favourite on the Mega Drive. Treasure were off to one hell of a start. Shortly after the release of Gunstar Heroes came another Mega Drive game, McDonald's Treasure Land Adventure. As I mentioned, Treasure were tasked with developing this to prove themselves, but three months into development they were given the go-ahead with Gunstar Heroes, so split the studio in half to develop both. This was finished first, but they decided to release Gunstar Heroes as their first game. McDonald's Treasureland Adventure is a platform game starring Ronald McDonald, based around the McDonald's brand. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? But it's actually not a bad little platform game. Ronald's main attack is some kind of magic powder or fairy dust of some sort, and he can extend his scarf to grab onto hooks, kind of like a grappling hook. There are a few upgrades to collect, and he can collect jewels and gold. Gold can be used to purchase items or play this little mini-game. It's a falling block game, much like Columns, wherein you have to line up three or more matching blocks. Quite out of place really, but it is a change of pace I suppose, and you can see that Treasure were, as always, trying to add something new to the traditional platform game format. The jewels you collect are needed to progress through the levels, of which there are four, a forest, town, sea and moon. He'll find himself in all sorts of places, including on a train, a boat and in space, even on a flying saucer. Each area has a boss fight at the end. Ronald's on a mission to find four pieces of a treasure map, hence the game's name, and along the way he'll meet several of the other McDonald's mascots like the Hamburglar. From a technical standpoint, the graphics are very good, the music is pretty catchy in parts, and most importantly it does play very well. All in all an okay game, while not blowing anyone away, maintain Treasure's signature quality overall. Next came Dynamite Heady, a platform game released for the Mega Drive in August 1994. Treasure continued to innovate with this one, as it added some new and interesting gameplay concepts to the traditional platformer setup. You play as a puppet called Heady, who has a removable head that can be used as a projectile weapon. He can chuck his head at enemies, but also use it as a sort of grappling hook to reach higher platforms. In a way, a progression of the idea implemented in their previous game with Ronald Scarf. Where it gets really fun is with the 17 available power-ups. These give him all sorts of abilities, many of which being the usual suspects like invincibility, speed boost, etc. But there are some great power-ups for his head. For example, one will see his head throwing attack split into three heads, one shoots missiles, one is even a vacuum cleaner that sucks in enemies, there are loads. The story follows Heady on his mission to prevent an evil puppet king from taking over the world. The colours and graphics are just stunning for a Mega Drive game, a trait which was becoming one of Treasure's signatures. It's very wacky, with a lot of Japanese arcade game influences here. There are lots of giant heads, weird cats and all sorts of mad stuff. Although primarily a platform game, there are also some side-scrolling shooter sections. There are nine stages in all, each featuring between one and four parts, which are called acts and scenes. If you like puns and blockbuster movies, you came to the right place, because all of Dynamite Heady's scenes are puns of popular films. Some of my favourites are Terminate Her 2, Toys in the Hood, and Fatal Contraption. The scenes feature numerous bosses and mini-bosses to take on. 
When the game came to the Western market, the difficulty was deliberately upped at the behest of Sega of America. They were thinking about the home rental market and didn't want Genesis owners completing the game too easily. In the end, the Western version was reportedly made twice as hard as the Japanese one. There are some other changes too, most notably the majority of the dialogue text was removed. Dynamite Heady was a critical success with reviews praising Treasure's programming skill and flair for going a bit over the top, with its huge sprites, mad boss fights and array of colourful levels. When Treasure had experimented in shaking up the platform genre with McDonald's Treasureland Adventure with little success, they really succeeded in doing so with Dynamite Heady, making this one of the most distinct platformers on the Mega Drive. 1994 also saw the release of the Game Gear port of Dynamite Heady, which was obviously very cut down and far shorter. Although it's not a patch on the Mega Drive version, it's still an accomplished platform game for the hardware and manages to keep the spirit and vibrancy of the original. It's also worth noting that a Master System port was later released by Tektoy in 1995, but only in Brazil. Only a month later in September 94 came yet another Mega Drive game, but this time a Japanese exclusive, Yu Yu Hakusho Makyo Toitsutsen. I'm probably butchering that pronunciation. This was a versus fighter based on the manga series Yu Yu Hakusho and featured 11 playable characters from it. The Supernatural manga series starred some dude who's basically a detective in the afterlife. For the most part, this is just like most other 2D fighting games of the era. You can perform combos and special moves, some of which require spirit energy to perform. The amount of spirit energy a player has is indicated by the blue bars at the top under each character's health. Where it stood out is that using a multi-tap, four players could play at once and fight on two different planes in the foreground and background. There were several multiplayer modes available too. Yu Yu Hakusho was developed in collaboration with the manga's publisher and its author. Although it doesn't seem great, it's actually not a bad fighter at all considering this is a Mega Drive game. Although this was never released in Europe or North America, Treasure's only Mega Drive game that didn't, it was released by Tektoy in Brazil in 1999, renamed Yu Yu Hakusho Sunset Fighters. In February 1995 they were back with another run and gun Mega Drive game, Alien Soldier. Unfortunately for Genesis owners, this never got a physical release in North America, having only been released on the Sega channel. Perhaps this is why the PAL and Japanese copies of this game command such a high price today. That and it was quite a late release, as many console owners had moved on to the fifth generation of 32-bit systems. Developed over two years, Alien Soldier is really an evolution of Gunstar Heroes. Many of the gameplay elements are the same, and it has the same sense of mayhem and relentlessness, with equally huge and showy boss fights. Lead developer Hideyuki Suganami wanted this to be an assault of the senses, and the gameplay was aimed at what they called hardcore gamers. The game has 25 levels and a whopping 31 boss fights, because in essence this game is a boss rush. The levels themselves are short and easy, providing little challenge, whereas the boss fights are extremely difficult. And I mean they're really short, there's often mere seconds between boss fights. The bosses are big, bold and feature some really varied and imaginative designs, although several of them very closely resemble those in Gunstar Heroes. The gorgeous graphics certainly help too. Incredibly, the original plan was for the game to feature a hundred bosses, which is mental. Some issues prevented this from happening, mostly time constraints, and some other elements were cut back too, like the backstory which would have been much richer. The story as it stands is explained in Alien Soldier's intro. Set on the planet Sierra in 2015, a race of genetically engineered super beings has risen up against the native human population. These beings have the ability to live parasitically within humans, animals and machines. A group of these beings have formed a terrorist organisation with the express purpose of wiping out the humans on Sierra, and you play as their leader, Epsilon Eagle. This next bit didn't make a lot of sense to me, the Sierrans plan the assassination of Epsilon Eagle by sending a super powered team after him, but then Scarlet, his own organisation, attack him for no well explained reason. The powers unleashed during this attack somehow throw him into the space time continuum, and some dude, she Tiger, takes over. 
But there's some more exposition and Zeke Tiger tries to kill Epsilon Eagle and I won't go into details here because it's long and very very weird but to cut a long story short Epsilon Eagle becomes a quote Birdman with steel wings. There's quite an array of weaponry and moves at your disposal in Alien Soldier. At the game start you can assign four of the available six weapons to use. These are Buster Force which is a more basic shot, Flame Force a devastating short range flamethrower, Sword Force, a light beam that decreases in power with increased range. Ranger Force, a spread shot. Homing Force, similar to the Buster Force but with weaker range and damage but will home in on enemies. And Lancer Force, the most damaging of all the weapons, a beam of light with limited uses. You can switch between your four selected weapons at any time and you'll need to move between them to let the others recharge, which they will do while not in use, although slowly. You can shoot weapons in 8 directions and there's also the option to switch between firing modes. Fixed firing doesn't allow movement but affords the player some accuracy and better timing whereas the other allows you to move at the cost of the directional accuracy. Epsilon Eagle has a few other tricks up his sleeve too. He can hover, cling to ceilings and perform what's called a zero teleport which whizzes him across the screen during which time he's immune to attacks. If at full health this move also damages any enemies in his path. Perhaps the most ingenious trick in his arsenal is a move that produces an energy ball very briefly which if timed just right will turn enemy fire into health. A pretty cool idea. That's quite a lot to get to grips with for a game of this type especially on a 16 bit console but once mastered it brings the player a lot of freedom and a strategic element to the gameplay. All these aspects combine to make Alien Soldier a very unique experience on the Mega Drive and continued Treasure's trend of innovation. Although I won't dwell on it for long, it's worth noting here that a Game Gear port of Gunstar Heroes was released in March of 1995, although it was developed by M2. They struggled to port Gunstar Heroes to Sega's handheld, which is nothing surprising when you consider that the original pushed even the Mega Drive's hardware, so it was a shorter and very cut down version, but ultimately they did a good job. Sadly for us Westerners, the Game Gear port was a Japanese exclusive. For their next Mega Drive game, Treasure ventured into new territory, releasing the isometric adventure game Light Crusader in May of 1995. The story is outlined in the game's intro, which blends some lovely animation with bits that resemble the in-game graphics. You play as Sir David, a knight in the service of King Frederick. When he returns from a long journey, the king invites him to chill and have some downtime in the village of Green Row. But when David arrives in Green Row, doesn't feel like its usual cheery self. In fact, the townsfolk seem on edge. David soon discovers why. Several of its inhabitants have mysteriously gone missing, and he soon agrees to search for them. It's not long before he finds himself in a huge dungeon network of rooms in which the bulk of the game takes place. This is where Light Crusader opens up into an isometric sort of dungeon crawler, hacking and slashing at enemies, solving puzzles, and making some often very annoying platform jumps. Anyone who's had to jump between platforms in an isometric game, especially moving ones, will know just how frustrating it can be. I played Landstalker a lot as a kid and I found judging the depth of the jumps to be pretty damn tricky, although admittedly Light Crusader isn't quite as guilty of this. The sword play is pretty standard stuff, but attacks get a bit more interesting when magic's involved. And magic plays a big part in the story, it's all very Knights of the Round Table. David can use magic based on the four elements, earth, wind, fire and the lesser known band member, water. Earth produces sort of an earthquake effect, fire and wind shoot out bursts of fire and wind in front of him and water heals some health. The elements can be combined to make new attacks, for example combining fire and wind creates a powerful burning wind, wind and earth makes lightning, air and water creates ice that can temporarily freeze enemies in place and so on. Combining three elements makes an even better attack and some of these are great like shooting six swords across the screen or generating a protective shield. Combining all four elements produces a devastating attack that harms all enemies on screen. You have a huge inventory too which you can fill up with all sorts of collectible items. 
The usual suspects are here like health potions and remedies, keys etc, and there are potions that restore David's magic meter or even make him invisible for a short time. There are some more interesting items too, like a costume which lets David sneak past guards, and a pendant which resurrects David at a room's entrance should he die. A lot of the puzzles in the game are the old push block here, activate pressure plate there kind of thing. Some require the use of an item, and interestingly some items will give the player the solution to a particular puzzle. And in usual treasure style, there are some nicely varied bosses to take on too. Although Light Crusader's music isn't as appealing as many of their other games, it's reasonably atmospheric for the gameplay style, and although this game probably won't wow most people, it is very nice graphically. Quite a strange entry in Treasure's library here, but one that certainly shouldn't be dismissed outright. January 96 saw Treasure dip their toes into 32-bit waters for the first time, with Guardian Heroes for the Sega Saturn, definitely one of my favourites. Despite the fact that the majority of developers releasing games in 96 were using 3D polygons, Treasure flew in the face of convention and played to the Saturn's strengths by making a 2D sprite-based game. A side-scrolling brawler, Guardian Heroes was partly inspired by two previous beat-em-ups, Capcom's Alien vs Predator arcade game, and Phil in Cafe's Mad Stalker Full Metal 4th, which was first released on the Sharp X68000. Treasure were more than comfortable sticking with 2D, as they had been developing 2D games for some time, and had perfected doing so. They felt that, if anything, it would be a 3D game that would have been the risk. And let's be happy they made that decision, because Guardian Heroes looked absolutely stunning in 1996, and it still does. 2D games always age far better than 3D games, especially those from the mid-90s, and Guardian Heroes is a shining example of this. This is far more than a mere side-scrolling brawler though, it's a beat-em-up RPG, and you'll find out why shortly. The storyline is probably too complicated to fully explain here, but essentially it follows a band of four heroes, the Guardian Heroes, who have found an ancient powerful sword and must protect it from falling into the hands of evil. The sword is the kingdom's only hope of preventing the land from succumbing to darkness. In reality it's far more multi-layered and interesting than that, but I thoroughly recommend playing it to experience the story. Well, stories. You'd actually have to play Guardian Heroes several times to fully experience the plot, as it features branching paths. There are 30 levels in all, but during each playthrough you'll only get to play about 7 to 9 of them. At the end of most of the levels, the decisions you make affect the path you take, so there are a great number of paths to follow overall, and it would take a good number of goes to see everything here. These choices not only affect your route through the game, but alter the story too, so you'll experience an alternate storyline, and maybe even encounter a different final boss. There are five different endings in total, although more than five ways to get to them. So, a beat-em-up with branching paths, we're already onto a winner here, and we haven't even met the characters or discussed the gameplay. The characters are introduced in a gorgeous anime video at the game's start. There are initially four characters from which to choose. Samuel Han, a swordsman who acts as the warrior type. Randy Green, the mage. Ginjiro Ibushi, a ninja. And Nicole Neal, essentially the healer. After you complete the game, you can also use Serena Corsair, a skilled and balanced fighter. There's another character to mention too, the Undead Warrior. He's the Ancient Sword's original owner, and pops up in level 2. Taking back ownership of his sword, he uses it to help vanquish your enemies, becoming your battle companion. Although he isn't a playable character, you can issue him commands. The story mode can be played solo or in co-op, but your party will be more than two characters at most points, including your NPC teammates. Picking your character comes down to personal playstyle and preference of course, with each having their own strengths. And now we get to another aspect that sets Guardian Heroes apart from other beat-em-ups, its RPG elements. After each level you can upgrade your character's attributes. During the levels you earn XP based on how well you perform. The more XP you earn, the more you'll level up. Then at the level's end, the number of levels you've gained corresponds to the number of points you have to spend here. There are six attributes to upgrade, strength, vitality, intelligence, mental protection, agility and luck. 
Some of these are pretty self-explanatory. Strength equates to power, vitality to health, luck increases your chance of landing and dodging attacks, and agility is, well, agility. The less obvious are intelligence, which dictates how adept your character is at using magic, and mental protection, which is your defense against magic attacks. This setup allows for a lot of freedom in customizing your character. You can pick a strong character and make them stronger, for example, but there's nothing stopping you from picking a magic user and putting points into non-magical abilities. It's up to you. Another unique selling point of the gameplay is that the fighting takes place on multiple planes. Your character can leap between the foreground and the background and will fight enemies on each plane. As well as spicing things up a bit, this adds a tactical element as you can jump to a different plane to dodge enemy attacks. The playable characters have an insane amount of different melee and magical attacks. Rather than the usual button bashing and 90s beat em ups, Guardian Heroes requires that you perform special moves more akin to a versus fighter, featuring button combos, directional moves and even Hadouken like actions on the D-pad. In addition to the stunning 2D graphics, Guardian Heroes has a great soundtrack. It was co-composed by a former Yellow Magic Orchestra band member and combined with some decent sound effects makes the frantic battling that more intense. Guardian Heroes goes so far beyond a traditional side-scrolling beat-em-up it's ridiculous. Multiple planes, a branching storyline, RPG elements, a wide range of moves, it really has to be played to be fully appreciated. The replay value is insane when you factor in the alternate paths and levelling up options. And there are other gameplay modes and options too, which I haven't touched on here. There's a reason that it's so highly regarded, and it's still considered an all-time great of the beat-em-up genre. In October 2011, a remastered version of Guardian Heroes was released on Xbox Live, which adds some nice polish to the original and changes the aspect ratio to 16x9. It's compatible with the Xbox One as well, and is on the store for just over 3 quid, so that's a good way to experience the game if you don't own a Saturn. June 1997 brought the release of Mischief Makers for the Nintendo 64. This was two firsts for Treasure, their first N64 game and the first game they'd released that wasn't published by Sega. This was published by Nintendo in North America and PAL territories and by Enix in Japan where it was called Yuka Yuka Troublemakers. This game doesn't seem to get as much love as Treasure's previous releases, perhaps in part due to the fact that it was an N64 exclusive. A colourful side-scrolling action platformer, Mischief Makers stars Marina, a quote, ultra intergalactic cyberbot. Her creator has been kidnapped by an evil emperor's minions and she's on a mission to save him. This storyline is a bit easier to grasp than some of Treasure's previous plots. Treasure stuck to their 2D guns here, despite the majority of Nintendo 64 games favouring 3D graphics. Although it is a 2D platformer, it's pseudo 3D and presented in the 2.5D style. This was actually the console's first 2D platformer. Marina can run, jump and slide, and being a robot, can use her jetpack to boost up to harder to reach platforms and objects. But it wouldn't be a treasure game without some innovation. In Mischief Makers, Marina can grab objects and shake them. Shaking objects allows them to be thrown at enemies, or will yield items such as weapons or health. Health comes in the form of these coloured gems, which can also be found littered around the levels. Weapons can often be altered by shaking them too, thus changing their shot type. Floating coloured balls can be found all over the place too, and grabbing these allows Marina to use them as a jumping off point to reach higher places. This mechanic of catching and shaking objects and enemies, although interesting, can be a bit tricky and takes some getting used to. Many critics bemoaned the game's controls, which were relatively complex for the N64's odd controller. The game takes place over 52 levels, set across 5 distinct worlds. There are of course some flashy bosses too, two to each of the 5 worlds, although most aren't a patch on those say in Gunstar Heroes or Alien Soldier. The platforming gameplay has a lot of puzzle elements too, requiring some lateral thinking and the use of Marina's abilities to solve. This can break up the pace a bit, and to be honest the levels are very brief so the whole pace of the game in general is a bit spotty when compared to their previous games. Despite its shortcomings, Mischief Makers is still a treat to play, has some great music, sound effects and voice samples, 
and beautiful graphics considering the hardware, and it's the game that many Nintendo 64 owners overlook. It was back to the Sega Saturn in September 1997 with Silhouette Mirage, published exclusively in Japan by ESP. It also came to the PlayStation in Japan about a year later in 1998, again published by ESP, but this time North America also received it, published there by Working Designs. Sorry to those in PAL territories, but this is one you'll have to import. This is part scrolling action shooter, part beat em up. It stars Shiner and is set on an apocalyptic earth. After a beautifully animated intro sequence from Japanese anime studio Gonzo, the game begins with Shiner leaving a futuristic facility amid a barrage of meteors that are raining down on the planet's surface, leaving destruction in their wake. To cut a long story short, some naughty scientists had been experimenting and accidentally created two attributes, Silhouette and Mirage. All of Earth's creatures have become imbued with one or the other. The two forces repel each other, but depend on one another to survive. This process and the formation of Silhouette and Mirage also creates a child called Armageddon. So basically, the Earth is bang in trouble. A supercomputer creates Shiner, the player character, to neutralise these two attributes, or in other words, bring balance to the force. Yes, Shiner is Treasure's Anakin Skywalker. Anyway, I hope you understood that better than I did. Not only do Silhouette and Mirage give the game its name, they also give rise to its unique gameplay mechanic. Shiner switches between the two elements depending on which way she's facing. Her outfit is red when facing right and blue when facing left. Enemies in the game, as mentioned earlier, take on one of the two attributes and are therefore susceptible to damage from the other. To defeat a foe, Shiner will need to attack with either Silhouette and Mirage, i.e. the enemy's opposite and she can only perform these attacks by facing one of two directions, so she'll need to get on the corresponding side of the enemy before attacking. This concept of duality is an interesting idea, and one that will see rear its head later again in the video. But that's not to say that attacking an enemy with the attribute they possess is futile, no. Doing this will sap some of their spirit rather than damage them. This replenishes Shiner's spirit bar, one of two meters at the top of the screen. One is for health and one's for spirit. If hit by an enemy of the opposite type she loses health, and if hit by the same attribute she'll lose spirit. Draining spirit is a good way to replenish this bar, but top ups can also be purchased, whereas health can only be refilled with a purchase. Shiner has quite the arsenal of moves, she can slide and perform a dash which can even make her run up walls and across ceilings. She has some beat em up style moves, and grabs which can be used to beat enemies until they drop money, or to toss them at other enemies. She has a projectile weapon too, and there are various power ups to pick up, many of which will be right at home in a shoot em up. Another useful move is a little shield that can deflect attacks from enemies of the same type. So rather than depleting your spirit, the attack will be deflected off of the shield, and bounce back to damage the attacker. Similar to Guardian Heroes, Silhouette Mirage has branching paths, although on a much smaller scale, but there are five possible routes to take. It also has what is in my opinion, one of Treasure's best soundtracks. Although it looks and sounds fantastic, Silhouette Mirage doesn't quite hit the spot when compared to many of Treasure's previous games. Although the ideas implemented here were innovative, they were perhaps a little bit too complicated for this kind of game. Nineteen ninety eight saw Treasure release their first shoot 'em up, Radiant Silver Gun. First published at the arcade by Sega in May, it was also ported to the Saturn in July of the same year by ESP, but was a Japanese exclusive in both instances. This vertical shooter was designed around the strategic use of the ship's available weapons. There are three primary shot types a standard up screen shot, homing shot, and a shot that fires two exploding shots diagonally forwards. Combining these shots can produce three more attacks, a reverse standard shot, a short range missile and a long range electric attack. The ship is also equipped with a sword which emanates from the front of the ship in a sweeping semicircular motion. This can be used to attack enemies at close range and absorb certain types of incoming shot. 
Enemies in Radiant Silver Gun come in three flavours, red, yellow and blue. Getting kill streaks on enemies for a single colour will not only award you with bonus points, it's also how you power up your weapons. Chaining kills of a single colour will upgrade the weapon used to kill them, an interesting concept. The levels were carefully designed to force the player into using this array of shot types strategically, often forcing the ship into enclosed spaces. Treasure saw this as a bit of a risk, it was their first arcade game and shooters had actually gone a bit stale at the time. Luckily Radiant Silvergun injected some life back into the waning genre. The story is largely irrelevant in a shooter but it does have one, and there's also a gorgeous animated intro, again as with Silhouette Mirage, produced by Gonzo. The music is more atmospheric and dramatic than your average Japanese shooter and wouldn't be out of place in a JRPG. When people mention expensive Japanese shooters on the Saturn, Radiant Silver Gun more often than not gets mentioned. It's not the best on offer in my opinion, but it's certainly up there. Several factors have resulted in copies of Radiant Silver Gun costing a fair few quid these days. It's Japanese exclusivity, relatively small sales figures and of course it's exceptional quality. It's by no means the most expensive shooter on the Saturn, not by a long shot, but it certainly isn't cheap. If you don't fancy destroying your wallet, it was released digitally on Xbox in 2011 and can still be bought on the store for a tenner. Treasure's next title would have been Gunbeat, an arcade racer revealed in February 1999. Initially planned for release that year, it was designed for Sega's Naomi arcade hardware. Treasure conceived the idea when the Naomi was announced, and it would have been their second arcade game after 98's Radiant Silver Gun. Gunbeat, their first fully 3D game, was partly inspired by wacky races and saw up to four players racing atop vehicles or creatures around a track filled with hazards and enemies. The multiplayer feature would have been achieved through the linking of cabinets. There were four selectable characters, Carmine who races on a hover bike, Mirabelle on a broomstick, Kunianya riding a giant flying squirrel, and Squad Man, who is himself a vehicle as he's a giant robot that can run and fly. It sounds insane and insanely fun. The racing element is built upon with the addition of action and shooting elements, so your character can fire projectiles which can slow down the opponents and also destroy the course's hazards and enemies. Each of the four characters would have their own special shot type. As with many of Treasure's games, scoring played a major part, with some huge boss-like enemies awarding bonus points if defeated, and the player can chain combos together to boost their score. The available footage doesn't really give much away due to it being filmed on a potato, and there are very few screenshots as well. It seems that the game was tested, featured in magazines and was shown in video only form by Sega at a Japanese Expo AOU in 1999 who were showcasing games for their new Naomi hardware. Interestingly, the other three games shown, Crazy Taxi, F355 Challenge and Zombie Revenge were all ported to Dreamcast. Seeing as the Dreamcast's hardware was almost identical to that of the Naomi, making arcade ports far easier, I'd put money on Gunbeat getting a Dreamcast release had it made it to the arcade. Gunbeat got a warm reception at the show, receiving praise for its speed, looks and signature treasure quirkiness. It's thought that it was cancelled when the project lead left the company, who Treasure were unwilling to replace due to their displeasure with the game's progress, so development was halted in May of 2000. In July 1999, Treasure released Rakugaki Showtime for the PlayStation, solely in Japan, published by Enix. The name translates to Graffiti Showtime. A 3D arena fighter, it stars characters that look like they're hand-drawn in crayon, presumably giving rise to its name. These scribbled doodles are called Rakugaki in Japan. Up to four players can scrap in various 3D arenas, and there's a heavy emphasis on throwable objects. In those respects, it has a lot in common with Capcom's Power Stone games. The characters do have some attacks at their disposal, but the majority of damage is done by throwing these projectiles, much like dodgeball. There are all sorts of things lying around to be picked up and thrown, but a little cartoon hand holding a pencil will pop up frequently to draw new objects in the arena. 
This is pretty fun if played with friends. It's very Japanese and there are really cool cutesy sound effects popping off constantly. This was already pretty sought after, having been a Japanese exclusive on the PlayStation, but it seems there was some kind of disagreement between Treasure and Enix over the characters or publishing, so Rakugaki Showtime was released in even more limited numbers. Later that year came Bangai O, oh, a shooter released for the Nintendo 64 in September 99 and for the Dreamcast in December. Although the Dreamcast version had a worldwide release, coming to Europe and North America in 2000 and 2001 respectively, the N64 version was a Japanese exclusive. As with Silhouette Mirage and Radiant Silvergun, it was published by ESP in Japan, with the Dreamcast versions in North America and Europe being handled by other publishers. Bangaio is an 8-way multi-directional 2D shooter in which the player controls a flying mech piloted by one of the two anime style characters. Set across 44 chaotic levels, you fly around shooting missiles at enemies, which include other mechs, drones and static enemies like turrets. There are also objects to destroy and items to collect. In addition to the standard missile attacks, a smart bomb of sorts can be used which fires multiple shots in all directions and this can be recharged by collecting fruit scattered around the levels. Each level has a boss that must be defeated to progress to the next. Despite the obvious differences in hardware between the N64 and Dreamcast, Bangaio actually looks pretty similar on both in visual terms. Yet again, Treasure seemed to get the most out of Nintendo's console graphically, steering away from its signature 3D graphics. Even so, the Dreamcast version has slightly improved gameplay and obviously has CD quality sound. The Dreamcast version allows for 400 missiles on screen at once, four times that of the N64, so there can be much more action on screen at any one time. This abundance of on screen elements is seemingly what Treasure were going for when developing Bangaio. Treasure programmer Mitsuru Yaida wanted to create a shooter that had a huge number of projectiles on the screen at once so opted to use a more simplistic graphical style in order to maximise this, and also to focus on the gameplay experience and speed. Hence the 2D graphics and anime style artwork. Bangaio is quite a treat to play, and it's stayed reasonably cheap if you fancy picking up a copy. In November of 2000, Treasure worked with Nintendo on their second Nintendo 64 exclusive, Sin and Punishment which was published by Nintendo only in Japan. It seems that Nintendo came up with the name Sin and Punishment, disliking Treasure's original title, Glass Soldier. This is one of my favourite Treasure games, and the only Japanese exclusive N64 game that I've gone out of my way to acquire. An on-rail shooter, Sin and Punishment is set in 2007, after some genetically engineered animals attack humanity. They were originally created to solve a global famine crisis, but some mutate and break free, wreaking havoc. I'm kind of on their side here, to be fair. The game was built around the N64's notoriously strange controller, so the control scheme allows the player to use the analog stick to aim, while strafing left and right, rolling to dodge and jumping. In contrast to the standard way the console's controller was used, this setup could be played either left or right-handed, so either the D-pad or the C buttons would control the movement depending on which hand was grasping the central analogue stick part. The aiming can be toggled between a free aim mode and a lock-on mode, the latter making aiming much easier but isn't quite as damaging. The game can also be played co-op, but strangely both players control the same character, with one aiming and one controlling the movement. It's played in third person, with progress forward through the levels being automatic, so you just focus on moving side to side, dodging and shooting. The gameplay is very arcade-like, and I suppose feels like a cross between games like Space Harrier and arcade light gun shooters like House of the Dead. The soundtrack is top-notch too, especially for the hardware. When working together on development, it seems that Nintendo thought that Treasure worked in an unusual manner, so there's a bit of a struggle there. Hilariously, Nintendo's director on the project, Hitoshi Yamagami, thought that the early prototype of Sin and Punishment was too difficult, and Treasure responded by saying that he shouldn't be leading the team if he didn't have the skill to play the game. Burn. Still, the difficulty was eventually toned down after a lot of back and forth. 
There's a reason that Sin and Punishment has become such a sought after game. It really is one of the best games on the N64. What a pity it never came to the West. Treasure's next game was another collaborative effort, this time working with Game Arts on Silphied The Lost Planet, a sequel to Game Arts' original Silphied. This was published solely for the PlayStation 2 by Capcom in Japan in 2000, and the following year in Europe and North America by Swing Entertainment and Working Designs respectively. This was Treasure's first PS2 game. This is a vertically scrolling shooter set in space. It's the 25th century, and hostile aliens have attacked a human inhabited planet. You're a pilot in a planetary defence force, controlling a ship that has a variety of weapons. Your ship can have two weapons equipped at one time, which you select from those available at the time. Decide which of your weapons you like to equip on the left and right sides of your ship. At the end of each level, if a sufficient score has been achieved, you'll unlock new weapons which will be added to your available options. Square and circle fire the left and right weapons, or both can be fired at once by pressing X. Although a 2D vertical shooter, the backgrounds are displayed in 3D and look pretty good. There are 3D cutscenes as well between stages, which progress the story a lot more than you'd expect from a game of this type. They look fantastic, and both the levels and cutscenes really pull off that futuristic sci-fi feel. Unusually for Treasure, Sylphie the Lost Planet doesn't do much to innovate, but it's a fun and decent looking shoot 'em up. Stretch Panic was released for the PlayStation 2 in 2001. This had a few names, being called Freak Out in Europe, where it was first released, and Hippolinda in Japan. This was Treasure's first true 3D game, and stars Linda, a girl with a demonic magic scarf. Linda's 12 sisters have been possessed by demons after the family receive a mysterious gift containing 13 demons. The 13th demon becomes trapped within Linda's scarf, giving it some bizarre powers. The aim of the game is to rescue her 12 sisters by exercising the demons possessing them, so the majority of the game is essentially boss fights. Levels are accessed via a hub world, which is mostly this black and white hand drawn style, with doors leading to the sisters and other levels. The scarf can be used to attack the sisters, it allows the player to grab an enemy or part of the environment and snap it back like elastic, hence the game's North American name, Stretch Panic. This snapping back will damage enemies, or Linda can propel herself forward to do a headbutt attack. This technique can also be used to propel Linda onto higher platforms and across gaps, as there is no jump function in the game. Not all the stages are boss fights though, some of them are straightforward platforming levels. Now what you do on these levels is a bit boring and certainly very weird. The only enemies are these women with absolutely massive baps. They look like they've all had a boob job that's gone very, very wrong. You attack these women with the scarf to collect their heads, and every five heads collected equates to a scarf bomb attack, which splits the scarf into three and deals a superb amount of damage. Fully deplete a sister's health, and she'll be exercised of the demon possessing her, thus freeing her. Each sister has a weak point which needs to be targeted to efficiently attack her. In theory, there's nothing stopping you from grinding the platforming levels to amass enough points, or heads, to just spam the sisters with scarf bombs, but that would make the game pretty tedious. An odd game indeed here, but it's certainly a landmark title for Treasure being fully 3D. Ikaruga is perhaps the shooter that most people think of when they think of Treasure. This was co-developed by G-Rev and published by Sega for their Naomi Arcade hardware. Originally released in Japanese arcades in December of 2001, it then received two console ports which added some additional game modes. The Dreamcast in September 2002, published by ESP, and then the GameCube in early 2003, published by Infogrames. The latter was its only release in the West, so PAL and North American console owners would need to play the GameCube version unless they were willing to import. It has since come to several modern consoles worldwide, so that's no longer the case. Ikaruga, named after an Asian breed of Finch, was a spiritual successor to 1998's Radiant Silvergun. This was at first glance your standard vertical shooter, 
but in typical Treasure fashion they aimed to bring a new dimension to the gameplay. It borrowed elements from Radiant Silvergun, having initially been conceived as a direct sequel, but also borrowed the shot type duality that we saw in Silhouette Mirage earlier. All enemies are either black or white, and fire bullets of the same colour. The player's ship, the titular Ikaruga, can switch polarity between black and white at the press of a button. The ship will absorb bullets of the same colour, whereas bullets of the opposite colour cause damage. Absorbing these bullets fill up a meter which can be seen at the bottom left of the screen, which gives the player a homing laser attack. The number of stored homing laser shots is indicated by the number below the meter, and a maximum of 12 can be stored at any one time. These homing laser shots, as well as your standard cannon, are your only two means of attack, and Ikaruga features absolutely no power-ups. The presence of the two distinct shot colours brings a new depth to learning enemy attack patterns, especially the bosses which can fill the screen with huge alternating waves of bullets. The scoring is affected by this too, with bonus points being awarded for chaining kills of the same colour. The game features five stages with three difficulty levels and offers a two player co-op mode. Ikaruga started off as a side project as most of the team were working on Sin and Punishment, so some assets were borrowed from Radiant Silvergun. In the end, only five members of the team worked on the game, plus three members of the G-Rev team. G-Rev were raising capital to fund their own projects, and did so by taking on developmental projects for other companies, including Treasure and Taito. G-Rev went on to develop two hugely acclaimed shooters for Sega's Naomi Arcade Hardware and the Dreamcast, Border Down and Under Defeat. Despite the Dreamcast version being a Japanese exclusive, Ikaruga gained quite a following among Western gamers even before the GameCube release and was widely imported. It later came to Xbox Live Arcade in 2008, Windows in 2014, and most recently the Nintendo Switch in 2018. Next came Treasure's first Game Boy Advance game. Tiny Toon Adventures Buster's Bad Dream, published by Swing Entertainment in Europe in 2002. On the surface this seems like a generic side-scrolling platform game, but is actually more of a scrolling beat-em-up. Buster has an array of attacks available, beating up animals he encounters along the way with a pair of boxing gloves that seem to appear out of thin air whenever he starts fighting. The combat is pretty good, with the player able to perform combos and specials, albeit in a rather repetitive fashion. Although Buster was the star of the game, which was common with Tiny Toons games, even when the game's title didn't bear his name, he could team up with various characters from the cartoon, including Babs Bunny, Dizzy Devil and Plucky Duck. Thought for many years to be a European exclusive, North American copies began surfacing on eBay in 2005, renamed Tiny Toons Adventures Scary Dreams. It's thought that these were produced back in 2002 in small numbers, but weren't commercially released. Buster's Bad Dream wasn't the only Tiny Toons game Treasure were developing in 2002, they were also working on Defenders of the Universe. This was an arena fighter heading to the PlayStation 2, with a rumoured GameCube release, planned to hit shelves in early 2002. Announced in 2001, it was originally named Tiny Toon Adventures Defenders of the Looniverse, a title which I actually prefer. It seems to have a lot in common with Treasure's previous game Rakugaki Showtime in that it's also an arena fighter reminiscent of games like Power Stone and has the same dodgeball-like gameplay aspects. The Toons throw bombs and balls at each other to cause damage, in addition to melee attacks and grabs. It certainly looks promising, with some lovely graphics and a fun soundtrack, but the reasons behind its cancellation are unknown. In 2003 it was back to the Game Boy Advance with Hajime no Ippo The Fighting, published solely in Japan by ESP. This was based on the manga series Hajime no Ippo, which translates to The First Step which dates as far back as 1989. It's all about boxing, and follows high schooler Makunouchi Ippo's boxing career. An anime series was developed much later, and ran between 2000 and 2002, so this game was likely tied into the anime's popularity rather than the original manga series. 
The anime even made its way to North America in 2003 under the revised name of Fighting Spirit. Treasure's Game Boy Advance adaptation is certainly good looking and would likely appeal to any fans of boxing games like Punch-Out. It's since been translated into English and a ROM hack is available online. Sticking with Japanese exclusives, Dragon Drive D Master's Shot was published by Bandai for the GameCube in March 2003. Again, this was based on a manga series, Dragon Drive, which ran from 2001 to 2006 about an underachieving high school student who plays a virtual reality game called Dragon Drive. As with Hajime no Ippo, it later became an anime series running between 2002 and 2003 in Japan and was distributed by Bandai in North America. The gameplay is air combat and sees dragons fighting each other in large arenas. The perspective is similar to that in the Star Fox games and plays quite like them. For the most part, the player is free to move in any direction, but it does have a few on-rails shooter sections similar to the Panzer Dragoon series. The dragons can shoot, perform a more powerful charge shot, produce a brief shield, lock onto enemies and dash in several directions to evade incoming attacks. Power-ups come in the form of collectible cards. Although the music, graphics and gameplay are decent enough, they certainly aren't exceptional. It does however feature some impressive anime cutscenes. For that reason, Dragon Drive probably appeals more to fans of the source material. A more familiar GameCube release from Treasure is Wario World, published by Nintendo. It was released in June of 2003 in Europe and North America, but didn't come to Japan until May 2004. As with Sin and Punishment, this was co-developed with Nintendo R&D 1, as Nintendo were keen to continue the arrangement after the success of Sin and Punishment. Wario World is a 3D platform game akin to Nintendo's 3D Mario games such as Mario 64. The difference with this game, apart from Wario being the star, is that it features much more of an emphasis on beat-em-up mechanics. The game takes place in Wario's castle, in which he hoards all his treasures. A cursed gemstone, the Black Jewel, has been unleashed from its prison and has turned Wario's treasure into monsters. It also splits Wario's castle into four distinct areas, Excitement Central, Spooktastic World, Thrillsville and Sparkle Land. Each of these areas contains two levels and a boss fight, and the areas can be accessed via a central hub, again similar to Mario 64. A total of 8 levels pales in comparison though, so Wario World is comparatively short when compared to other 3D platformers in the Mario universe. Wario jumps, dashes and punches his way through all the levels, and can perform various throws, grabs and grapples. These are generally more powerful than the standard melee moves, swinging your opponents round to smash into other enemies, or pile driving them into the ground. Along the way Wario can rescue little creatures called Spritelings, who had sealed away the Black Jewel long ago and have now become imprisoned. There are 40 to save, and the game's ending will vary depending on how many you rescue along the way, resulting in Wario's castle ending up progressively grander the more you collect. You can also retrieve various forms of treasure throughout, including red jewels which are required to progress. Collecting all the treasure rewards the player with unlockable minigames for WarioWare on the Game Boy Advance, which can be accessed via the GBA link cable. Wario World is much more of a platforming beat-em-up than a 3D platformer, so it's quite refreshing. Just a shame that it's a bit on the short side. Two thousand and three was a busy year for Treasure. Their second Game Boy Advance game and fourth release overall that year was Astro Boy Omega Factor. This was published by Sega and was developed by Treasure and Sega's hitmaker studio, formerly AM3. It was published at the tail end of 2003, but the US release was held off until 2004 to coincide with the release of the Astro Boy TV series there, and didn't come to Europe until 2005. As a result, the later Western versions improved some aspects of the Japanese original. Omega Factor is a scrolling beat-em-up that sees Astro Boy brawling his way through crowds of robotic enemies and follows a plot involving time travel that drew elements from several pieces of Astro Boy source material. As such, 
the story has a large number of characters with unusually detailed profiles and backstories. As you punch, kick and blast enemies with your hand cannon, you'll fill up an EX meter at the top of the screen. This meter can be used to perform any one of three special attacks, a supercharged hand cannon blast, a machine gun spread shot which hits all enemies around you, and an EX dash. Astro Boy can also fly using his rocket boots, and there are even some sections that differ from the scrolling beat-em-up format, instead playing like a horizontal shooter. On easy mode, the game is significantly easier due to the maximum limit of 99 EX attacks, and the meter fills up pretty quickly. It's limited to 5 on normal, so it's quite easy to spam the EX attacks on easy mode. Whenever you meet one of the game's many characters, both good and bad, their image gets imprinted on your soul, filling up your Omega Factor. These serve as points to spend on upgrades, slowly increasing your stats, attack power, health, laser cannon and machine gun power, rocket jets, and your senses, which makes things like seeing in the dark easier and helps you find secrets. The story is confusing at times, but actually pretty cool. The game ends somewhat undesirably, but you're given the chance to replay the levels, finding secrets and more hidden characters, and unlocking more levels, in the hope that you can change the outcome of the game to something more desirable. This obviously creates alternate timelines, so when you play the levels for the second time, they're slightly different. The character interactions are altered too, quite often because Astro knows what's going to happen. This leads to some amusing exchanges where people think he's a mind reader, and you meet other time travellers and stuff like that. This is a cracking little beat-em-up which will please fans of the genre, and the scrolling shooter sections are a welcome palette cleanser in between brawling. This one flew under the radar for a lot of people, but it's a treasure game that's definitely worth playing. One of the best games on the Game Boy Advance in my opinion. After their team up on Ikaruga, Treasure were back working with G-Rev in 2004 for Gradius V, published by Konami for the PS2. Yes, this was Treasure's first time working with Konami since the team left Konami in 1992 to form the company. This was obviously an entry in Konami's long-running Gradius series, although the fifth main Gradius instalment, it was in fact technically the 15th entry in the series. A horizontal shooter, Gradius V sees you piloting a famous Vic Viper ship through sci-fi inspired levels. These do look fantastic, with huge detailed backdrops in outer space, and within futuristic space stations. The levels in space are by far my favourite visually, with large structures filling the screen atop a backdrop of deep star fields and beautiful planets. Obviously, the levels taking place within structures play quite differently, as the gaps can be quite narrow. Set in 8010, the plot is largely irrelevant being a shooter, but space battle, time travel, yada yada. Gradius V can be played both solo or in two player co op. There are four different power up configurations from which to choose, and later a custom array can be unlocked, allowing you to mix and match power ups to create your ideal configuration. There are, of course, various power ups to collect, granting your ship superior firepower, speed, missile shields, and the like and options the little satellite gun turrets as is common with shoot 'em ups The music and sound effects are decent, with Hitoshi Sakimoto, the composer for Radiant Silver Gun, providing the score. You can definitely see hints of Treasure's style here. Graphically, it's often reminiscent of their previous shooters like Ikaruga, and let's be honest, it looks stunning. The level of detail is astounding, and the sense of depth to the levels is a welcome touch. Just a shame the game's so damn hard, as I'm not the best at shooters anyway. Treasure's next two titles were handheld revamps of two of their most classic games. The first was Advanced Guardian Heroes in late 2004, published by Treasure in Japan and Ubisoft in North America and Europe, although the European release wasn't until early 2005. If you hadn't deduced from the name, Advanced Guardian Heroes was a sequel to Guardian Heroes on the Saturn, and Treasure actually had to obtain the rights from Sega who owned the license. Its story takes place some time after the events of the original. Being a Game Boy Advance game, this is quite the departure from the original gameplay wise, but does retain its spirit. You start off with three playable characters to choose from, 
and two players can team up in co-op to play through the story mode. There are a ton of unlockable characters, taking this roster of three to a significant number. It's again mostly a scrolling beat-em-up with loads of boss fights and the odd platforming section. The most immediate notable difference is the lack of the three planes of the first game, with the player being able to move freely forwards and backwards on the z-axis rather than having to jump between distinct planes. The core aspects of the original are all here, decent graphics, a wide range of attacks and magical spells, and the RPG-like levelling up system. It also adds a new magical barrier system, which the player can use to defend and perform counter-attacks. Experience points are gained by collecting crystals left behind by downed opponents, and between levels the player can spend these on increasing various stats like health, defence, attack, agility and magic. The crystals vary in value depending on the enemy that left it, and throughout the game the player character will take on the heroes from the original Guardian Heroes. When defeated, their souls are absorbed, increasing one of your attributes by 10 points. Any excess crystals can also be spent on unlocking new characters, and as I said, there are a lot of them. Advanced Guardian Heroes does a lot of things well. It's fun, it looks good, and there are a superb number of characters and moves. The story isn't nearly as interesting as the original, and it lacks the branching paths that made the original so replayable, but seeing as it's running on the Game Boy Advance, it's a pretty good effort. The second reimagining of a classic game was a handheld sequel to their first release, Gunstar Super Heroes, known as Gunstar Future Heroes in Europe, released in late 2005 for the Game Boy Advance. This one was published by Sega. As with Advanced Guardian Heroes, the events take place after those of the original, and stars two playable characters called Red and Blue, but they are different to the pair of heroes in the original game. At first glance, this is just the Game Boy Advance version of Gunstar Heroes, featuring the same hectic run and gun gameplay and snazzy bosses. There are, however, several changes. The melee combat aspect has been built upon, allowing the execution of several different attacks using the D-pad in combination with the attack buttons. The throws have been removed, as has the ability to combine weapon types. Instead, the player can hold three weapons at one time and switch between them on the fly. Overall, this is a great entry in the series, and one that plays to the Game Boy Advance's strengths. It looks and sounds good, with some nicely drawn still images for the story, and features several shoot 'em up sections to break up the run and gun combat. If you're a fan of the original Gunstar Heroes, or run and gun games in general, then this is definitely worth a look. I think that's where we'll leave this video. Of course, 2005 wasn't the end of the road for Treasure. They went on to develop several Bleach games for the Nintendo DS and Wii between 2006 and 2008, a sequel to Sin and Punishment subtitled Star Successor for the Wii in 2009, two Bangayo sequels, one for the DS in 2008 and one for the 360 in 2011 and their last two games, Geist Crusher and Geist Crusher God, in 2013 and 2014 respectively, both for the 3DS. As far as I can tell, Treasure is still around, but they haven't released anything since 2014. I'm not sure if they have anything planned, and rumour has it they're still getting offers, but I can only hope that they have more to come.